chapter of the Gospel of John, and uh, we have been going through a study here, and we're really looking at the rejection of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, and, uh, and, and really this is his first real public rejection that he has, in, has encountered yet, and it's coming from these religious leaders uh, here in Jerusalem. And we're looking at Jesus' response. This is part three of our lesson of Jesus' response to these religious leaders. And so um, we've kind of been on the subject of the Sabbath day. This is a Sabbath day miracle, and that's what's caused all the fuss. And, and you know, I, me and my wife, we were kind of talking about things, you know, a little bit. And, and, and she was talking about Sabbath day and how important it is to take a rest. And I told her, I said that, you know, Satan doesn't ever take a day off. I don't think I should either. And she said, you need to find a better role model. <laughs> Somebody look at the person beside you didn't laugh and explain that to them, would you? But anyways, we've been looking at this study, and, 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 and our focus of this study is Jesus Christ. And the way he is known to the then-known world is just a Jewish rabbi. We know him as the Messiah. We have the complete word of God in front of us. We're opening it that way, and we're looking at him as the Savior of man and the son of God, but these people, they just see him as some Jewish rabbi, and at this particular time, in the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus was walking the streets of Jerusalem, happened to be on the Sabbath, and as Jesus made his way towards the temple, he saw a crowd of desperate and sickly people gathered around a fountain there called uh, uh, Beth, uh, Bethesda, and, and as these people gathered around it, they were super, superstitiously looking to these waters for miraculous healing upon their bodies. And, and our Savior, filled with compassion, he searched this crowd for whom he could help most. And, and Jesus found one man who had been a paralytic for 38 years, a man with whom had no friends. He had no money, and he had no hope. Of course, obviously, he's at this fountain of superstition. And, and the men... The man, he could not find the help he needed in the temple. He was outside the temple. The temple was right next door to this particular fountain. And so by his superstitious motives, he came to a pool named Bethesda. And it was widely believed the waters in this pool could heal physical ailments for people that were in desperate conditions. And so that's what draw masses of crowds. And people fall for these sorts of superstitions every day. They buy these candles and they by rocks, and this is no new thing, this is nothing out of the ordinary, this is something that we are very familiar with in our society today, but the, the bottom line is the temple had let him down, he's been beaten down physically, obviously, but more than that, spiritually, I believe that this man is completely defeated in his condition, and so this man, he, him laying there on that little mattress, that little bed, a little rolled up piece of cloth that he might have been laying on there, Jesus searching the crowd. I don't believe that Jesus looked and saw this man's physical crippled condition, but I believe he saw right through his ailments and looked right at his heart and saw a man that was broken spiritually. What good is physical help if you have no joy, amen? And so this man, desperately burdened by his physical condition, desperately burdened by not having any friends around that would help him into the water, desperately burdened, by extreme poverty, set there broken in more ways than one. And I believe that it was Jesus' most compassionate moment was when he looked beyond this man's physical ailment and he looked at his heart. And, and I mean, I can't stress enough, years, 38 years of physical oppression, years without friends, and now he's putting himself in a position of hope in something that will never help. He's got a hope in this fountain that will never bring him healing. And worse than that, he can't even make it to the water when it's time for him to fall down into it and receive this superstitious miracle. And I want you to hear the compassion in the Savior's voice as he approaches this broken individual. Chapter 5, and verse 16, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The man came undone with this question, and he told Jesus, he says, Sir, I have no man to put me into the water when the water is stirred up. And while I'm coming, when the water does stir up, and I begin to drag myself towards the water, and he says, But while I am coming, another steps down before me. This man's voice, I imagine, would be as close to cracking in this instance, realizing that he is only gathering there for no purpose at all because nobody will help him into the water. He'll never make it, and he's trampled underfoot. He said, nobody will help me get into the water. Instead, they trample over me. They push past me. They cast me aside, to which Jesus responded so compassionately. 
He looked at him and he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And that prompted Jesus in his most compassionate form to perform this miracle was the man's reception of this miracle. And in verse 16, Jesus, it says that he knew that he had been in that condition a long time. And I think that there is a physical condition that is obvious. But there's also a spiritual condition here that was not so obvious to at least those standing around. They didn't care how depressed he was or how broken he was, but to Jesus he cared. And I believe this is not only in reference to his physical condition, but it's his spiritual condition in verse 16. And he, when he asked him if he desired to be made well, he didn't mean, do you want to walk again? Do you, do you want to be well? It's okay. I've been perfectly healthy before, but not been well. Can you say amen if you've ever been there? No physical ailments, but you're just not well. This man had a problem of both. And after this miracle took place, the crowd of sickly people, they gathered around this man, hundreds if not thousands, and they began to examine his complete healing. And the multitudes now ignoring the fountain of superstition, and they began to inquire this man, what had happened, what had happened? And this crowd became so large and constricting that Jesus had to slip away before the man could, could catch his name. And so later that same day, Jesus found this man in the temple giving thanks to God for his newfound health. And when Jesus approached this man, we have our second clue that I believe that his condition was more than physical that Jesus healed. Jesus come to him in verse 12, and he says, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Jesus had to remind him of the reason of his physical oppression and his spiritual depression. Jesus linked the man's condition to his sin. He said, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And yeah, it could be sin that led to his injury. You know, some people drink a lot, they have cirrhosis of the liver. Some people smoke, they lose their lungs. Some people do drugs, they lose their teeth. <laughs> you know, there's things that drugs do to you that cause you to lose stuff physically. But also sin destroys your soul. And so he is speaking to his joy that he had just found that now he's in a place he hadn't been in 38 years, the temple, and worshiping God for a mighty work. Don't sin. This is a good thing you got for, going for you. You don't want to go back to where you came from. And so the Jewish leaders of this time, they took a serious issue with this miraculous work that Jesus performed because he did it on the Sabbath. He said, hey, man, if you're going to be healing, just don't do it on the Sabbath. That's unacceptable. They found Jesus to be guilty in their own hearts of two crimes. The first was a lower case misdemeanor charge, if you will of performing work on the Sabbath day, working on the Sabbath. So it was an egregious offense as far as their standards are concerned, but it's not the end of the world. I imagine people got caught working on the Sabbath regularly because they had so many laws, who can keep track of them all? And second, I believe, would be equivalent to a felony charge, making himself equal to God. And for the misdemeanor charge, the death penalty may be a bit harsh of a punishment, but not for these religious zealots. They wanted to kill Jesus for working for commanding this man that he'd work on the Sabbath. And Jesus also performing a miracle on the Sabbath was also a crime. But that didn't stop them. They just saw, they just said, you know what, let's just kill him for this. We need to make an example. It's been a little while, maybe. But notice the reaction to the felony charge. I'm calling it a felony. That's really not what it is. But I'm helping you to understand the levels of blasphemy that were around at this time. And so they said to him in verse 18, they says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, they already wanted to kill him for breaking the Sabbath, but they sought all the more to kill him because also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And he said God was his father, meaning we are of the same cloth, the same nature, the same substance. These men already sought to kill Jesus for his first crime, but now... If they had the ability, they'd kill him, dig him up, and kill him again. That's how mad they were at him. Awful. Just for healing somebody on the Sabbath day, isn't that repulsive? And What would motivate such a person to react so harshly? And I read a description by John MacArthur that helps me get a better understanding of these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these religious zealots, and these scribes, and what their big deal was. And he described it this way. He said, the Pharisees and scribes, along with the Sadducees, had demonstrated their unworthiness as the shepherds of Israel. The religious nobility and the rabbinic academy of Judaism was altogether unqualified to represent God. 
They misrepresented the Old Testament. They corrupted the people. They produced sons of hell, as Matthew 23, 15 says. They thought they were enlightened about God, but in reality, they were blind leaders of the blind, Matthew 15, 14. They perceived themselves to be the protectors and purveyors of God's word, when in truth, they had substituted the traditions of men for the commandments of God. And though they convinced themselves that they were pleasing the God of their fathers, they were actually children of their father, the devil. And so that lets you know who we're dealing with. And so Jesus purposed uh, in his heart, and, and, and Jesus possessed the power that they didn't have. His motivations were different than theirs, and his power come from a source of God, and theirs come from discipline of a worldly sort. And so Jesus, he, he possessed a authority, and this offended them. This is another motive of theirs. They didn't like how Jesus could clear the temple. You remember we talked about that? They didn't like how he could command a multitude to follow him, and they would. They didn't like how he spoke about the scriptures as though they were a part of him. As he understood them in ways nobody could possibly understood them. And they felt that their authority was slipping away. And, and Jesus was gathering a following and theirs was shrinking. And the praise of men has now shifted from them to him. And, and, and as these, these religious zealots were examining their power and their authority and their lordship failing them. And this person of Jesus Christ, they deemed it was unacceptable. And this man should die for it. Mind you, for centuries, these men have perfected the oppressive work of Sabbath day lordship. For centuries, they have made themselves rules that everybody needs to follow or be punished for. And for centuries, they have carried out punishment on those who have violated the rules. And for centuries, men praised them. And now it's all falling apart. And so what was Jesus at this time? He was a wrinkle in that fabric. They didn't like it. They had a very mainstream way of worship, and anybody going against the grain should die for it, even if he is the Son of God. These religious leaders could not believe their ears. Everything they have worked for, everything they have built, all is now at risk. And Jesus must die before they lose control. That was what they purposed their heart. Like, why would he kill them over working on the Sabbath? A lot of people have come and worked on the Sabbath, I'm sure didn't die. But no, Jesus was a bigger threat than them. Meanwhile... God's beloved children have suffered under the lordship of these wicked leaders, seeking to make themselves equal to God on their own account, seeking their own selfish glory and seeking their own religious righteousness. And so Jesus has been charged with blasphemy for working on the Sabbath and for making himself to equal with God. And so what we are examining is Christ's response. He says, you are the blasphemers. You work all Sabbath day long selling sheep and goats and oxen to my children and making merchandise of my children. And you are the Sabbath day workers. You work to perform the law. You work to keep the law. And you don't even do that right. Secondly, he defeats them by saying that you have blasphemed God by making yourself equal with God. Mark tells us that they sought to make themselves lords of the Sabbath. And that's exactly what they were, right? If you're the judge... You're basically the Lord of an item, and when it comes to the law, they thought that they had the sole right and responsibility to interpret God's word for you people. You don't need to read your Bibles. I'll tell you what it says, is what these Pharisees believed, and what these zealots believed, and these scribes. And so they're self-seeking, self-glorying, and they're self-righteous in their actions. And so the response of Jesus is amazing. The first charge of blasphemy, Jesus said, my father has been working unto now, and I have been working. So Jim, Jesus is simply saying that, yeah, me and my father are one, and because he works, he holds the world together seven days a week. I work and hold the world together seven days a week. People exist on Sundays. That is the first obvious act that God works on the Sabbath, which means the Sabbath was intended for us to rest. God don't need rest, first of all. His endurance is unequaled and unfailing, but it's for us. And Jesus says, the Sabbath ain't for me. You can't charge me for working because I and the Father are one. And also, you can't charge me not being equal with God because I am. And then he goes through and he lists out the equalities that he shares with God as the Father. And, 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 he, and, and, he, and he goes on to tell them that they share the same duties, the same authorities, and he has the same charge. And, and all of that is at work seven days a week, even on the Sabbath. There's nothing you can say, nothing you can do 
uh, to argue with that because these are factual information. And, and these guys didn't want to hear it and they didn't want to believe it because it wasn't about whether Jesus was guilty of blasphemy. It was not about whether Jesus was guilty of breaking the law of Moses. It was about Jesus taking from them what they think they deserve, and what they think they have earned, and their rights in society at that time. And so, hoping their hearts are conditioned for the truth, Jesus then proceeds to give them the gospel in verse 24. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. And most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And Jesus is telling, them that these, telling these accusers that life apart from submission to me is death. Take it or leave it. You already heard from Nicodemus. I already told him he has to be born again. Here is a guy, I've used this illustration before, I'll use it again. This is a guy that made, made Billy Graham look like uh, Billy Idol. <laughs> I mean, this guy was as religious as they get. He had the Bible memorized front to back. It was a part of his DNA. And he's not attacking them for not knowing the words of God. He's attacking them for not knowing God. And that's a real possibility, ladies and gentlemen. You can know the word of God. But that doesn't mean you know God. And so that is what Jesus' charge against these zealots is. In verses 31 through 40, Jesus calls his witnesses to the stand. Jesus begins by saying, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And Jesus is not claiming to be a dishonest person. He's talking in the realities of a courtroom experience. Now say we have a, an accused murderer going to take the stand, and he, and he gets on trial, and they say, did you kill that man? He says, no, I did not. Well, without any other witnesses, how reliable is that source? It's not a slam dunk, as they would say in a courtroom. It's not a smoking gun that he reveals of himself to be innocent. And so Jesus is not saying that I'm untrue. I'm just saying, he's just saying that I understand your system of, of, uh, of, of testimonies, and I understand your system of courtroom appearances, and I know that if I just tell you that I'm the Son of God, you're not going to believe me. But he says, let me call somebody up who you will believe, and that is John the Baptist, or at least you believed him for a little while until you found out why I come. And these religious leaders know John very well. John's father was a Levite. He worked in the temple. Very reputable family. And John himself garnered much notoriety because he preached as one having authority. And he was the last known prophet. And people followed him by the thousands, including these very religious leaders who have a, a problem with Jesus. Why would they follow John if they didn't believe that John was pointing towards the Messiah. Obviously, they dwelled in that light. And so verse 33 says, You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, and he was the burning and shining lamp, and you are willing for a time to rejoice in his light. What happened? Oh, you found out that I'm not the Messiah you planned out in your head. I'm not the Savior that you imagined me to be. Instead, I'm one to point at your sin in your life and to tell you you need to fix it at the foot of the cross. And so they didn't like that. For a while you delighted in his preaching. You believed him when he said one is coming and now is. And you believed him. You sold out for this. And then you sent Nicodemus. And Nicodemus come back and said, hey man, he said our righteousness is not good enough. And you turned me down. And you rejected me then and you're rejecting me now. And evidently, uh, and then and the next after, after he calls John, Jesus then calls a greater witness, as the scripture says, and that is the works which the Father has given him to finish. The very works that he does bear witness of him that the Father has sent him. His works. Do you know why Jesus is in this mess right now? <laughs> for his works. <laughs> he healed somebody on the Sabbath. He's like, is that not good enough for you people? This guy hadn't walked in 38 years. Who else has ever done that? No one. Is that not good enough? Am I not good enough should be the right answer, the right question. And no, they thought he wasn't good enough. And the current mess Jesus was wrapped in was a direct result of these works, not to mention him calling Lazarus from the grave, not to mention him healing somebody 20 miles away, not to mention blind people seeing and deaf people hearing and lame men walking and lepers becoming clean and everything that brought thousands of people from all over the then known world to follow Christ. None of that was good enough for them, but Jesus says it's good enough. My works testify who I am. Find somebody else who can do this. 
And so they charged him with being of his father, the devil. They said, oh, he only heals people because he's of the devil. Doesn't that sound like something the devil would do? Wouldn't he just go around fixing people with issues? No. Their arguments are ridiculous and unbelievable. Then Jesus calls his third witness. I believe this is the best and most important witness of all. Verse 37. The Father himself who sent me has testified of me. What better advocate could you have than the voice of God on your behalf? No better testimony has ever been given about a person in the world than one given by God himself. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? Heavens were opened up and the voice of God shouted, shouted from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father testified of him. Not just in scripture what we're going to get into. He testified with his voice from heaven. So that nobody would be confused as to who Jesus Christ was. That is his son. His own nature. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they were led up a high mountain where Jesus was transfigured before them. And his face it shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And then suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Well, that's a good testimony. You couldn't chalk that up as thunder whenever it is articulated perfectly that they can translate the words to paper for us today. Father also testified of Jesus in the scriptures. And Jesus charged these religious leaders with ignoring the pages of God's holy word. They pride themselves on being Bible versed. That's their big deal. That's how they govern society. That's how they had life. It was all off of scriptures, or so-called scriptures, as depending on how they twisted it for their own benefit. Verse 38 says, You do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Many false religions use our Bible to this day. They think they have eternal life because they can read the words on these pages. But any person on this planet could read these pages. But not any person on this planet will have the word abiding in them, living. Who is the word? In the beginning was the word. Yes. Word was God and the word was with God. God will abide in you. He says, you do not have me in your heart. You read the scriptures for how it will benefit you. I talk about sacrificial worship. You see dollar signs. I talk about work, you see oppression. They don't see Jesus in mercy and grace and love. It is from here that we can close this exchange between Jesus and his accusers. And this, the, these religious leaders may know their Bible. They may know the empirical evidences of scripture. And they may know the, even the historical truths of the nation of Israel. But they do not know Jesus. It's the big fail in their operation and and I'll shoot in rapid fire succession the final seven verses to you, all as we see how Jesus brings his closing statement to this sham of a trial. And he first targets the motivation behind man and himself by declaring that some seek honor from men. And then he corrects their thoughts, processes by telling them that they should seek honor from God. Seeking honor for men instead of seeking honor for God. And then finally, Jesus says, even though they claim to honor Moses and the scriptures, they in fact do not. And so let me read our scripture. Verse 41, chapter 5. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receives honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Father, I thank you for this text that has tumbled its way through the centuries all the way into our lap. What a terrific aim you have, Lord, that you would land your word in our life through all the chaos of this world, how privileged we are, God, that we can open them. We can discern for ourselves your son, Jesus, and we can use this book to do it, and we can have faith in this book because it is truth. 
Would you bless every ear in this room and every heart, every pair of eyes and every pair of ears, Lord? Would you bring change in our life? God, if there's somebody here who does not know your son, Jesus Christ, Father, I pray that you lay it on them. I pray that you minister to them in a way that they know that they have been in the presence of the Most High God, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, they seek honor from men. And so Jesus, he came to receive honor from the Father. First of all, let's get that out of the way. He didn't come here to impress any of you. He didn't come here to hear you give him an applause. He didn't come here for that. He came but to die to satisfy the wrath of God. To honor the Father. He came to seek the will of the Father. He came to be obedient even unto death for the Father. And evidence of this nature is found in the time he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. We were talking about in our Sunday school class how Jesus was 100% man and 100% God at the same time. And I want you to know that that means he hurt. That means his flesh was breakable. And that means his stamina was not what it would be if he was in the throne room of God, but he humiliated himself and humbled himself to take on the frail character of flesh that we are all wrapped in as well. And as he looked at the cross and he thought about the scourgings and the beating and the spittle, you know, people spitting in his face and slapping him and bruising him and the disgust, these people looking at him and the pure hatred in their heart as he can sense their emotions He cried out to the Father in that moment as he witnessed this happening. Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Y'all have a hard time praying like that, ladies and gentlemen. When I want something, I want it. I leave that open-ended part off at the end. Father, if it is your will. He asked for God's will twice. If it is your will, take this cup. But if it's not, it's your will. Let me have it. I'll drink it. I ain't scared. And knowing what lies ahead, that scourging, that punishment, those beatings, those whippings, those batterings, those humiliations, the slanderings, and even death, Jesus was willing to set aside what he himself wanted in order to satisfy the Father's needs selfishly, obediently. And Jesus, he, he contradicts their motives with his own motive. He says, I don't receive honor from men. I'm not doing this so you all be proud of me. I turn down the honor of men, even if it means I can avoid the cross. Even if it meant he could avoid crucifixion, they would have made him king. You'll remember when he rode in that Passion Week on Wednesday, and they threw palms at his feet, and there were thousands screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna. They would have made him king on many occasions. He turned it all down because he didn't want their honor. And that would dishonor the Father. And these religious leaders are self-honoring human beings. They don't get it. They're never willing to carry any cross. Only concerned with self-preservation. And not only that, everything they do, they do to the applause of men. They live to be complimented by men. Oh, great sermon, pastor. Great religious event, pastor. Oh, that was an awesome sacrifice that we had this evening. They love that. And so Jesus, he goes on to tell them, That he knows their hearts. And in their hearts, they do not have the love of God. If they did, they would love the one whom God sent. His first sign, right there. They would be supporting the ministry of Christ. They wouldn't be trying to destroy it. They would be 100% behind Jesus and his efforts. Instead, they are placing themselves in front of him and willing to kill him to stop him from honoring the Father. At the very least... They would, they would just rejoice over a miracle, a man being healed for the whole subject of this investigation. They weren't even willing to be grateful that they seen a miracle. <laughs> willing to overlook something that has never happened before in order to crucify him. And after all, it was by the healing that this man decided to enter the temple to praise. They got one more church member and they weren't happy, right? When Jesus healed him, where did he go? He went into the temple to pray. They ain't even happy with the growth of, 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 of members in their church. And how disgusting of people. You are the blasphemers, Jesus is telling them. And the result of the healed man's actions are God glorifying, not man glorifying. And that bothered them. They were in there praising God and not, not them. Remember how the Lord spoke to Ezekiel describing 
these religious leaders. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The Son of Man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to you shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and with cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field. And when they were scattered, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Secondly, they don't seek honor from God, right? Jesus continues his thought by compounding his previous statement. I do not receive honor from men, but he goes on to say, I have come in my Father's name. And he's simply saying, I am not self-seeking, I am not self-serving. Instead, I am on a mission that my Father has given me, and I will accomplish it to his glory and not my own. Jesus continues by saying, you are so far out of God's will that I have come in his name, and you do not receive me. God sent me (laughs) from heaven. He spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. I did a miracle, And you don't receive me. That's how far out of God's will you are. There are people like that. They don't see what we see. They don't hear what we hear. They're not participating in the religious activities like we do with real worship because they're so far away from God. They don't even, they can't even hear his voice. I want to be so close to God that if he whispers, I can hear him. They're so far away. If he yelled, they wouldn't hear him. They have surrendered to their own selfish desires for so long that when a messenger of God comes, even the Messiah, they have no idea what's happening or what's going on. And the stubbornness of sinful living has a lasting impact. You know what, how you get calluses? Does anybody here know how you get calluses? Some of you don't work. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I heard about it. I don't get calluses. I don't work either. Uh, um, you get calluses by friction of work. Habitual abuse to your hands while performing a duty. And Jesus was callous performing the duty of God. These men were callous performing the duties of Satan. And so on their heart was a layer of tattered flesh that made their hearts impenetrable to the word of God. That's what sin will do for you. You keep doing a sin long enough, you become so hard about it that it doesn't even seem like a big deal anymore. Now it's, it, it goes from being a, a sin to a little sin, to not a sin. The progression is always the same. You start justifying it. These guys justified what they were doing using the word of God. People in the church do that. Well, God said eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I'm like, can you show me? Can can we work this out? I thought we're supposed to love our brother the way we love ourselves. I thought vengeance was mine, saith the Lord. People use and yield scripture as an instrument to defend their sinful actions. It's no different than what these people are doing. Jesus said, you're so numb That if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. They're so numb that that they will fall for any self-promoting religion that comes their way. They're easily deceived. You know when you're self-promoting and you're self-seeking, it's easy to be fooled by someone who's just like you. And then next thing you know, you're pandering their needs and yours get left unmet and get unnurtured. You're easily fooled, you're vulnerable, you're a target, and and you'll utterly submit to the false religions and doctrines of the world because you have denied the one true doctrine, the one true religion, and that is me, Jesus Christ. Jesus then, he moves on to ask them a rhetorical question. Verse 44, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Their belief is impossible as long as it is self-indulgence. Their belief is futile, as long as it is self-honoring. If you're looking to please men rather than God, you'll be wrapped up in falsities forever. That's a fact. I'm not sure you know this, but it's impossible to please men. This young man's father, her husband, used to tell me all the time, ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. That's the truth. 
Pleasing men is impossible. If you seek in your life to please men, you're going to let them down. You're going to let yourself down. Have you ever struggled to be on the in crowd? Have you ever set your heart to do anything to make it into any group? I've done that. I remember when I was a freshman in high school, I joined the soccer team, and I found out shortly thereafter that I was not as popular as I was in junior high. I had to start over on my popularity scale. I'm a fish, and this was unacceptable to me. There wasn't much I wasn't willing to do to make it a part of that in crowd. The cool kids club, as I've heard it said, and I would break the rules. I'd make fun of whomever. I didn't care. I'd make fun of you if it meant that I was going to get in on that crowd. I don't care. You could be my friend, and I would make fun of you just as long as I didn't lose my status. I'd even degrade myself and do stupid, silly things. I'd do embarrassing things that would dishonor my parents just for a simple laugh. One day, I finally made it into the in crowd, and I said, I did it. And a short time later, I found myself to be the subject of the same antics I performed. Now I'm the guy they joke about. Now I'm the guy that they pick on. Now I'm the guy that they physically abuse in order to gain their social status and I find out it's a dog eat that dog circle I was the brunt of the jokes physical attacks boy that was a miserable fall find out being on the in crowd wasn't even worth it you see seeking the honor of man only ends one way self-destruction you become a product of your own creation and that's not very good and I became a bully so I could be bullied I became a liar so that I could be lied to. I became a slanderer so that I could be slandered too. list goes on and on and on. And these Jewish leaders are in the same boat. They seek not to honor that comes from God. Instead, they're self-willed, self-promoting, self-indulging. And that it ultimately leads to their own self-destruction. You know the Apostle Paul? He's a Pharisee. What did they do to him? Did anything to be a part of that crowd. And when he made something out of his life and he made a decision, they killed him too. Lastly, they foolishly claim honor from Moses, verses 45 through 47. These religious leaders believed that the law of Moses was the way they could conducted themselves. They believed that that was their very actions. They believed their DNA was found in the Mosaic laws. You can examine my righteous works and know that I am godly because I am the word of God in motion. The words found in the first five books of the Old Testament were their pride and joy, except they powered that lifestyle with selfish ambitions. They didn't do it seeking Christ. They kept the word of God because it made them feel good. They kept the word of God because they felt righteous and separated and different from the sinner that is down the street. They used the words of Moses to promote themselves, to elevate themselves, and to gain a self-righteous lifestyle. And Jesus then cuts these men the deepest by saying these words, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Moses was their big deal. He was their Messiah. He's the one who brought them power and kingdom and religion and authority with the law. You think that you're obeying the law? You think that you're keeping the commandments as, you, uh, as your father Moses has written them, but when it when time comes, Moses will tell you straight to your face that you were wrong. He will tell you, you missed the point. Scripture goes on to say, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Every word that come out of Moses' mouth led to Jesus Christ. Now, I can't leak it to you personally, every single word, but God will, and he can Jesus didn't begin in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, on the day of creation, who do you think was in the burning bush? All of society at this time lived in accordance with the, what these men believed to be interpret, uh, interpretation of God's law through the writings of Moses. And all of their standards of living have some derivative of Moses' commandments. And the problem is they begin to manipulate, change, and even disregard many of Moses' commandments. And Jesus basically was saying, if you truly believe Moses, you would believe me because our words are not in opposition. They're in harmony. If you really had faith in the law that Moses brought, you'd have, you, you, you wouldn't have changed it. You wouldn't have added to it. They didn't really even believe Moses because they took do not work on the Sabbath and they made it 600 other things. They didn't even trust Moses. 
And therefore, you miss the greatest mystery in the law of Moses, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. I see Jesus in the Ten Commandments. I see a man that obeyed every one perfectly. I do not see that I have to obey every one perfectly, but I see a son of God who did so that I don't have to. If you don't believe the scriptures as they're written, how will you believe Jesus' words? He said, if you don't believe Moses the way he wrote them, you're never going to believe me. If you can't get in touch with the scriptures, you can't get in touch with me. If you can't take the word of God and apply it in a way that it was intended to be applied, you'll never take me and apply me to your life the way I'm intended to be applied. In Jesus' resting arguments, he asked them this final question. How will you believe my words? You claim to live your life by the law of God. You claim to honor the Father with your conduct and worldly living. But I tell you, it is by the law you shall die. You live by the law, you die by the law. If the law is your standard for living, the law will be your standard for dying. Resting on your righteous fulfillment of the law is not going to end well for you, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're guilty in one aspect of the law, you're guilty of all the law. You can't just be like, well, I only killed one person. <laughs> Y'all going to take that from me? I only killed one person. I, don't, I shouldn't go to jail. You know, I obey every other law. Guilty of one, you're guilty of all. Romans chapter 8 describes the differences between law keeping and grace. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I want to ask our music leaders to prepare a song of invitation as I go to close. After Jesus' closing statements, I can't help but ask myself a simple question. Does my life appear to be God-honoring or man-honoring? Who comes first in my life? That's a simple question. There's a simple answer. It's a yes or no. Does God come first or does he not? There's always an excuse why you don't fully commit. There's always a job. There's always a sports event. There's always somebody sick. There's always, I don't feel well. There's always, I worked late. There's always an excuse. Always, always, always an excuse not to fully commit. But there's only one excuse to commit because you owe him your whole life. If you've accepted him to be your Lord and Savior, you've committed a life of discipleship and following him every second of every day. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your might. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your mind. That's everything. That is everything. Sabbath day, worship. If only it were that easy that we would have to participate in a relationship with God one day a week. It's not the requirement for a Christian. It's a lifelong walk. Why don't we serve God with our full and whole bodies? Those reasons are su <coughs> excuse me. Those reasons are summed up in the lessons we've examined today. Are we man pleasers or not? And I want you to know, being man pleasers doesn't mean that you're pleasing other people. You know, if you're pleasing yourself, you're by definition, a man, you're still a man pleaser. Do you seek to please God? Do you seek to honor him? Pleasing God is not found in keeping the law as these Pharisees have presumed. Honoring God is not found in being gatekeepers of the law. Pleasing and honoring God is found by honestly, constantly, vigorously seeking his son Jesus Christ on a daily basis pursuing him wherever he goes. And it ain't always pretty. And it ain't always fun. And it ain't always easy. But it's what we're called to do. Are you doing that today?
Maybe you are doing that today, but what about tomorrow? Today is, you know, maybe we can call it their Sabbath. Maybe you are doing that today. What about tomorrow? About the day after that? What about all the week long? We could all be better. Father, I thank you for this time in your word, and I thank you for this closing argument that Jesus has put at the feet of these disbelievers, these accusers, and these attackers. I thank you those words are still true today. I thank you for the challenge that you presented even to the believer today. We should pursue you with all our heart, mind, and soul. And we should honor the Father as you did. We should honor God as you did, Lord. We should glorify you by doing so. Would you bless every heart in this room as we give this invitation, Lord? If there's somebody who wants to know your son, Jesus, like this, with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, Lord, I pray that you'd encourage them to come down and speak with me, Father. We might open the scriptures and see the path to the cross, Father. Would you bless this invitation? I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?